common common for this course in terms of assessment is is a, is a course project which you do by yourself. And um, a few of you have, have started asking me, can you give me some more guidelines, uh, what might be a good project? And some of you know, emailed and asked me about potential topics already. What, from my perspective, this is how I see it. I would really like you, if possible, to be able to do a project on something that will be applicable to your thesis or your research. So for those of you that are in M set, this might be a little bit too early, you don't know yet what your project will be on later. Uh, for those of you in the Masters or PhD streams, maybe you've already got a little bit into your research, uh, but if you've just started your Master or PhD, it's unlikely that you'll have a clear idea of where you're gonna end up uh, a few a months or years ago. So that may be hard to, to combine this and get that two for one. So it would be great if this, if your project could form a chapter in your thesis, that's kind of the ideal case, but it doesn't always work out that way. Um, even, to me it's also okay, even if it doesn't make it as a, as a big chunk of your thesis, as if you maybe take some data that you've already collected in a lab, or from some a previous student who may have collected the data in your research group, you may want to take a different look at that same data set. So that wouldn't normally be admissible in your thesis as a new chapter because someone else did the lab work and experiments and so on. But if you take their data set and you look at it from a different way and you contrast it to their original thesis, uh, there might be some interesting new results that you pick up or at least you confirm uh, what the, the other student found. If that doesn't work, you can always look at a theoretical investigation. There's a number of topics in multivariate data that are open-ended. You'll start to see that as, as and onwards. Not everything is clear-cut. PCA is pretty well established in terms of how things work, but this this might be even open, open. There are still, in fact, open topics on cross-validation. There's a new topic that's just come up uh, in the past few years. I'm looking at it from a randomized data perspective. Um, I, I can talk about that later on um, in this in the course, but I won't do that right away. But if that's something that might be interesting to you, you can always email me, I can email, uh, send you links to papers that will be relevant to that topic. You can look at different ways of handling missing data. Although I'd say that topic is pretty well covered already, there's been some comprehensive research done in that area. But the, uh, the topic of robust PCNPLs is particularly appealing these days, especially for systems where you take the data and automatically build a model and a human likely never looks at that data set, so that model, okay? That happens quite frequently these days. Models are automatically built, and so you really want that model to be built in an automated way so it doesn't get influenced by outliers and other bad data. So can we make PCA robust to those problems? Uh, so how to center and scale robustly is easy, but how to actually build the PCA model so that it doesn't get influenced by outliers? In other words, you want to prevent someone having to go look at your T-squared plot, your SPE plot, your score plot, and see, okay, here's an outlier, exclude it, and build a model. How can you just build the model once, from scratch, without having any human intervention, so that it basically comes out as it would have come out had you manually done it, okay? Adaptive PCA and PLS is, a, is an extremely interesting topic uh, that is very uh, widely used when we apply PCA and PLS models online. In a chemical process, we don't have stable operation. Okay? Once you measure a temperature, that calibration of the temperature probe will change over time and will slowly start to drift. We get fouling of our reactors and heat exchangers. So the correlation structure that you model at one particular point in time doesn't stay steady for the next few months or years. It starts to change. So what will happen very often, and we'll talk about this topic in the future, is you might build a model and then let's say this is the time scale and you're monitoring your process, this is the T-squared limit, and this time is in the order of years. If you didn't ever change the PCA model that's underlying this, you'll see it working well initially, it picks up your outliers and so on, you can go do contributions and diagnose that in the usual monitoring way, but then what starts to happen is, in general it will start to trend up Okay, or it might, this might be SPE is usually where we see this happening. It starts to trend up because the whole plot, because of changes in your process, 
that model that you built originally back here two, three years ago isn't valid anymore. So it's always going to throw alarms. So it's going to raise false alarms for you. So how can we make our model automatically update itself um, in, in real time? So that's an interesting topic. I can also send you papers on that if you that's something that's interesting. But orthogonal signal creation is a topic we will probably see a little bit of that in the next few classes or the hints of that. Sometimes we, when we're uh, doing regression models, the variance in x isn't always applicable to y. So how can we first remove uninteresting variability from our data set in x before we use that to predict y? If none of those theoretical topics seem to interest you, there's always some practical data sets. There's many, many available data sets on the web. One particularly interesting website that's shown up recently is this Kaggle.com where companies submit data analysis competitions to the open public. You can go download the data set and try to win the competition. These are three competitions that are currently running right now and will close in the next two months, which is the perfect opportunity for a project for this course. They're all prediction data sets, and that's actually the topic of today's class is prediction. Can you predict someone's credit score given a variety of other factors? Can you predict if a car will be a bad purchase? So there's a whole lot of X variables. Can you predict yes or no, this is going to be a, 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 good, a good or bad car to purchase? Uh, can you predict how much shoppers will spend the next time they visit the supermarket and when the next time is that they'll be coming? Okay, so those of you that are like shopping or marketing type projects. But always far more interesting than someone else's data set is your own data set. So if you can generate your own data set, that would be super. You might have a digital camera available to you, and you can take digital images. That's a whole big X matrix right there. And if you take several images over time, you're generating multiple data for yourself. You might want to use it to detect defects in the image or changes in the image of some property of interest. So for example, if you photograph a banana for once per, once per every six hours, over a three or four day period, you'll see that banana or that fruit rotting. So can you tra track in the image how that trajectory of the fruit is changing? And, and what aspects in the image are changing? So we'll talk about image analysis in the next few, um, maybe two or three classes from now. So that might be something that you can look at. Uh, you could also um, use a soft sensor uh, or try to do a soft sensor project. If you've got a good distillation column model in G-Proms or in Aspen Tech, you might use that to develop a soft sensor and use it in open loop and closed loop. So develop the model with the distillation column in open loop and compare it to the model developed in closed loop and see how different those models are and how well does that predictive soft sensor perform. We'll look at soft sensors in next week's class. Multi-block data sets. Today's class, we're going to deal with two blocks, an X block and a Y block. But in about three classes from now, we'll start to look at the issue of many blocks of data. So this often happens in the lab, where you take, a, say, a plastic sample, and you get a one set of measurements from one piece of equipment on that plastic sample. You take it over to another piece of equipment, and you get a, a complementary, different set of variables. And you may have the data that you um, collected when you made that plastic sample, so the reaction data, you may have the raw materials you used to make that plastic. So you've already got four or five blocks of data right there on the history of that plastic sample and how it's gone from raw materials to processing to lab measurements from instrument one and then lab instrument two. So you have the multi-block data analysis. We'll talk about multi-block coming up in the next few classes. For those of you interested more in control groups and the MACC group, you can look at control system performance to monitor and track how well a controller is working and if you can detect when that controller is degraded. We'll look at quantitative structure activity relationship modeling also in a class or two from now. This is uh, a tool that's used for drug development and for new product development and for finding interesting leads for products. I can send you some literature to get started on that. This is really interesting, how to do design of experiments in the latent variable space. And you can look at different ways of doing that. Um, or if you've got financial data, that there's plenty of it available online. Financial data is very interesting. It consists of things like, are you married? Yes or no? Do you live in a house or apartment? 
how much do you earn, are you male or female? There's a lot of yes, no, uh, or categorical variables. So use those as your X data to predict something of interest. That's in fact uh, very similar to this problem, uh, one over here, so predicting someone's credit score based on a whole lot of categorical pieces of information. Okay. So what I'm looking for from you is about a few weeks from now, if you can hand in a page that just describes your general idea that you've got, what your data consists of, and where you plan to go with this project. Just so I can see you're on the right track. And this doesn't lock you in. You don't have to stick to that project if, if say, after the past and fourth of November you come up with some other great idea, you can easily switch. But this is kind of just a, a stage just to make sure you're on track and you're, uh, that you're doing something that I feel is going to be of reasonable quality and a reasonable complexity for this course. I really don't want you to analyze a trivial data set as a course project. That's good work. So this is just to make sure that that doesn't happen. You'll be presenting a class. So the class just prior to the 9th of December will be the last class that I give. Then the next two classes are the classes that you're going to give. So right now there's about 19 of you registered for this course. So that splits it about only over a three hour and a three hour block for you to present for 15 minutes. So about 10 minutes presentation, five minutes Q&A. And then I'll look at it for a report from you after the new year. I have to double check this date. I know that the graduate students, I can hand in the grades after Christmas. It's not, um, not, it's not like the undergrads where I have to get the grades prior to Christmas. So there is some flexibility there to hand in after Christmas and the new year. So that date might change, but it should generally be after Christmas. And I'm looking for a 25 page report at most. Appendices, any, anything you want to include in the report, Maximum 25 pages. I really don't want more than that. Preferably less. Okay. So, any any discussion topics or anything if you might question on that. So, if you've got some ideas, like I said, a few of you have already emailed me. Um, please uh, bounce it by me, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Or by the fourth of November, you can just give me a brief outline of what you're thinking. Okay, so today's class, we're moving away, <laughs> as Marissa said, finally we're going to get away from a single block. We've had enough of PCA, so we're going to leave that behind. Not quite just yet, the first part of the class will actually come back to PCA, just the block it one more time. But today's class, we're looking at the case of two data blocks. So we'll uh, have our first data block, X, and then we'll have another data block, Y. Now Y could be one column, it could be several columns. And the general aim for when you've got two data blocks is linear regression. That would be the, the, the canonical example of it, of a two block problem. Where you're collecting data in X and using that to try and predict Y. So these squares would be a classical case. These squares, of course, though, always has just a single Y column. You, don't, you cannot do these squares with multiple columns. And the sort of things that go into Y are anything that you generally don't have in the future. So when you build this model on offline data or historical data, then in the future this happens. You get your new observation X, and you're trying to predict Y hat. Okay. So the sorts of things that go into Y are generally the things you don't have available to you when you want to use them. So for example, that credit score example in that case study that I just spoke about. X data would be, am I married or not? Do I live in a house or an apartment? Do I own my own car? Do I have insurance on that car, etc.? Have I paid my credit cards in the past 30 days? Those would be my feature variables or variables that go into X. And I'm going to predict, yes, give Kevin a loan for $30,000 to buy a Hummer. What I want to buy with that money. So that's your aim. I can have this data in the future. I want to predict some why. In this course for the chemical engineering side of things, why would be typically things like concentration of, the, of some species in a solution or some sort of quality variable. So whatever defines quality for your for your problem. 
might be the viscosity, the molecular weight, uh, conversion of a reaction. Um, so those would be things that are not available to you in the future, but your X data is, and you're going to try and predict that. So that's what goes into X and what goes into Y. You could also even have in Y things like uh, binary variables, so success or fail. Okay, so it's a yes, no variable. Your Y could be a single column with one for success and zero for fail. You're trying to make a prediction, and then if your prediction is close to one, you, you consider that a, that new observation has been a success, or if the prediction is close to zero, you consider that a prediction to be fail. Okay. So yes, you can build models with categorical variables that are integer. Just in the future, you have to realize your prediction might not, it's not going to be an integer. It's going to be a, a, a number with decimal places that you can round it up to. So that could also work as your primary. Okay? So we may have, like I said, in linear regression, we'll have a single column of y. But in general, we'll have multiple columns, especially when we deal with this in chemical engineering, with quality. Because when we're selling a product to a customer, we don't sell it based on one feature. We usually say, this product has viscosity within this lower bound and this upper bound. That's one quality variable. It has a density of a certain value, and it has certain other properties. So we usually collect a handful of properties together and form our Y matrix. It's not just always a single column of one. Okay? So that's, that's where we're working with today. Today's class is totally on this case of how do we go from one data block to the other, and how do we relate, relate these two blocks? Together. And we will be talking about it in the prediction sense, though I will also look at it later at the end of the class on how do we learn from our data set. So in the future, we, we usually want to make a prediction of why, but sometimes we don't, we're not always interested in that. Sometimes we're just interested in how do X and Y work together, and can we learn the relationships between X and Y? Okay. By that I mean it's not always that X causes Y. Sometimes y causes x. What do I mean by that? Well, we're used to this concept of cause and effect, where if I change something, we see a reaction. And usually the thing we change, people often think, well, the thing we're going to change, that goes in x, and we're going to predict the reaction in y. That's not always the case. Take, for example, the situation of a of near-infrared probe. So our x matrix. I'll just draw one vector, so one vector in x, one row in x, is actually the near infrared spectrum. So we take our sample, got it in a glass beaker here, I've got my near infrared probe, then I put a beam of light through and I read the, the NIR signal back. If I plot it here as a function of wavelength, I will see my near infrared spectrum as follows. Well. So that's just one row in x. And my corresponding y variable is maybe concentration of a, of a certain species of, of interest. So there's some species A. And I would like to build a predictive model that, given the near infrared spectrum, I can predict the concentration of A. Now, the cause and effect is not that the spectrum causes the concentration. The cause and effect direction is actually the other way. It's the concentration of A that causes the spectrum. Okay? So we'll have a bit more discussion on that topic next class, but I just wanted to emphasize that X and Y, it's not necessarily causal information goes in X and the output goes in Y. Sometimes it is the other way around. And for that reason, I will talk about the X matrix as the input matrix and the Y matrix as the output. Because okay. I, I don't want to say this is the causal variable and that's the response. Or, uh, that's often the terminology used in these squares. I'll call this the response. As if that's what's responding to some action. It's not, not always the case. Okay, so I'm going to look at it kind of from an algorithmic point of view. Here's a black box. I'm going to give it some inputs. 
and I'm going to get, it, get an output from it. And what goes in this box is my model. So that could be a least stress model, a principal component model, or a PLS model. So I'll use the terminology generally, input for the X specs and output for the Y specs. Okay, so let's take a whirlwind tour through some concepts from the 4C3 course on covariance, correlation, and least squares. Just to get you all on, on the same level here, because this is actually extremely important to understand the rest of the today's class. Covariance. Let's imagine I've got a, a gas cylinder and I've got the temperature measured in the room and with, I'm measuring the pressure inside the cylinder. Okay, so there's a room and there's a certain temperature in that room, there's a gas cylinder, and I can measure the pressure inside that cylinder, P. And I can also measure inside the room the humidity. And the room's temperature changes by this much, and I read these corresponding pressure values, and I read the corresponding humidity values. So if I wanted to calculate the covariance between temperature and pressure, I would use this formula. The covariance between a variable x and a variable y is defined as follows. This is a definition that holds in general. Take x subtracted from its mean, y subtracted from its mean, calculate the product of that, and then measure the expected value, in other words, the average. What is the expected value of that product? And that would be a, a covariance number that gives you the covariance between x and y. Now, you can so show that if you plug in covariance with, of x with itself, that's nothing more than the variance, okay, using that standard formula for variance. You can also show that the covariance of a centered vector that you pre-centered is the same as the variance of the vector that's centered, because the covariance function up here centers the data all the time. Okay. And so I want you to have this idea that covariance just describes the tendency between two variables but it's not very informative. It's actually not a very useful measure for the following reason. I can calculate the covariance matrix. So the covariance of temperature with itself is that number. That's in other words, the variance of temperature. Right? We said the covariance of a variable with itself is the variance. So that's the variance of temperature, the variance of the temperature column. But the covariance of temperature with pressure is 6,780. It doesn't mean a whole lot to me, okay? That number, I can't interpret it very well. The only thing I can interpret is, it's positive. So as temperature goes up, pressure goes up. And we can see that in the data. Okay. The temperature is increasing over here. The pressure is increasing as well. The covariance between temperature and humidity is a smaller number, 35.4. But again, I can't interpret it a whole lot, other than it's, it's close to zero. Maybe there isn't really a, any variance or any covariance between those two variables. Maybe it's just noise. But it's hard to tell. There's no, no exact, no sort of absolute scale I can work along. In fact, if I were to change the temperature variable from Kelvin to Fahrenheit or degree C, I'd get a whole set of different numbers over here. Okay? So it's not very useful to scale scaling either. So covariance, while we'll use it later on towards the end of today's class, I just want you to realize it's not a very useful number. So to make it very, to make it a bit more useful, what we do though is we, we remove the scaling effect by dividing the covariance here on the numerator. We divide it through by the variance of x multiplied by the variance of y and we take the square root of that. The variance of x is a scalar number, the variance of y is a scalar number. Compute the product and take the square root. And so what you end up doing then is you get a number that's dimensionless because the units cross out for x and y. So that's great. If we go change our, our pressure variable or our temperature variable to a different set of units, it doesn't matter because we'll cancel out that unit uh, change over here anyway. And the other nice thing is you can prove to yourself quite easily that this number covariant uh, correlation ranges between minus one and plus one. Okay, so correlation R 
between a variable x and y cannot be outside those bounds. And in fact, the square of r is nothing more than an r squared value that you used to see in linear regression, which is why the r squared value in linear regression ranges between 0 and 1. So you just square that number out and you get your usual r squared value that you used to see in this Okay, so it, this is a much, much more useful number to work with because of this, this uh, dimension uh, so that bound that we have. So now when we look at this correlation matrix, we see the correlation with the temperature with itself is obviously one, the correlation of pressure with itself and the humidity with itself is always going to be one. But now we can see that pressure and temperature, yes, they're very strongly correlated because that number's up there by 0.9. Well, humidity and temperature and humidity and pressure, those are, are pretty uh, low correlation numbers. Okay. So the key formula to remember is this one up here, which we're going to see it again later on. Correlation then is the ratio between covariance and variance. Okay, that's that should be straightforward, just a recap from, from undergrad stats course. Any any questions on that? So let's, let's move on then to these squares. When we look at these squares, we're taking, I'll start with the case with just a single variable x and a single variable y. We take those two variables x and y and we want to create a relationship between them, some model in other words, where we multiply x by a first coefficient beta 1, add an intercept term, and then we have a residual to get our y value. So that's the, that's the model we use. And what we aim to do is put everything we cannot model with this simple equation. That unmodeled error goes in, into the residual scheme. And it consists of measurement error and other noise and variation. We cannot explain it. Okay. The important part to note is that that error is due to y. So in other words, this part over here, plus B0 plus B1x, that's the part we can explain of y. And the error that we cannot explain of y goes in the residual. This is not the error of x. This is the error of y goes in that residual. And when we fit the model, we want to calculate the best estimates possible for B0 and B1 that will approximate beta 0 and beta 1. And what we'll do, though, in this derivation here quickly, is I will first center the data. And the reason why I'm doing that is because it just makes things a whole lot easier. But it's not, it's not a bad thing to do. If we go center x and center y, basically we're removing that, that intercept, beta 0. But we can always get back to it if we really would like it. If we'd like to know what the intercept was, we can simply recover it by taking the mean of y subtracting it from B1 times the mean of X. Okay. And let's, let's presume we have this model Y is equal to B1 times X. If we get a new observation X in the future, we can get our best prediction of Y that multiplying X new by B1. So that's straightforward. You're all looking very bored at me, so, so I'm, you must be understanding this really well. So we're going to pick up in a minute. We're going to go next uh, to uh, multiple linear regression. So this picture, just before we move on though, is the geometric explanation of what I was just saying. So there's our best fit line that's got a slope of B1, our x variable, and the values along this line represent y hat. So in other words, there's my y value that I used to build the model. y hat is my prediction given this x value. And that vertical distance there is my residual error. If you wanted to calculate that model, you can easily prove using the same um, optimization approach we used in the PCA class last time. What we want, the objective function for these squares is to minimize the sum of squares of the residuals. It's exactly the objective function of PCA. The objective function of PCA was to minimize the sum of squares of the residual matrix E. In this case, in, P, in these squares, we we're just minimizing the sum of squares of the vector E. But PCA, we were just minimizing the sum of squares of the matrix E. Okay. 
So it's much easier to do this derivation for these squares because we don't have any constraints. So no Lagrange multipliers, no eigenvector decomposition to come and haunt you. Here we just say minimize the sum of squares with residuals E, expand E as Y minus V1X, take the square of that. And if you expand that term and take the partial derivative with respect to V1, set that equal to zero, you get your usual equation. V1 is equal to X transpose Y divided by X transpose X. What's really interesting here is, okay, remember I've centered the data X and Y. What does X transpose Y represent? Remember we, we spoke about this in the second class. What, whenever you see a dot product, so A transpose B, what does that mean? Sum of squares of the elements, but uh, sum of the elements multiplied with each other, so the dot product. Cosine between the It's the angle between those two vectors. And so we said last class that is equal to A transpose B is the cosine of the angle theta between A and B. So A transpose B divided by magnitude of A and B. So you can just take these two scalar numbers over to the right hand side and that would be one way to interpret A transpose B. Another way to interpret A transpose B or X transpose Y is as the covariance. nothing more than the covariance. Because I take x and I multiply it by y, element by element, and then I calculate the average. So x transpose y, or let's say rather the covariance of x with y is equal to x transpose y uh, divided by n, the number of observations in vector. So whenever you see x transpose y, it's actually just n times the covariance of x with y. So if we look back then at our formula for b1, that regression coefficient, it's nothing more than the ratio of the covariance of x with y divided by the variance of x. Okay, so the n cancels out in the numerator and the denominator. So b1 is the covariance of x with y divided by the variance of x. That would be another way of looking at it. And so two, ver two variables that are extremely tightly correlated will have a, have a strong slope, and variables that are not correlated at all, in other words, the covariance is pretty low, will have a slope that is approximately zero. So when you, whenever you see equations like this, try to actually interpret what these matrix quantities mean. There's usually an easy way to figure out what that means geometrically. Take it back to something that you can understand. And usually one of the key things you'll see are transposes of vectors, these dot products, very easy to interpret. Okay, some other things that you should realize from least squares. The sum of the residuals or the average residual is equal to zero. It's easy to prove that x transpose e is zero. What does this mean? There's another dot product. Sorry? X and e are orthogonal. They're orthogonal because the angle between x and e is equal to zero. So the cosine of uh, the inverse cosine of zero is a 90 degree angle. Okay, so residuals have totally uncorrelated with the input data. In other words, there's no information in the residuals that's already in the x's. Also, you can show that y hat transpose e is equal to zero. The fitted values from the model are orthogonal to your residuals. That's also an important relationship. In other words, everything you predict, what's left over in the residuals, is totally independent of the, of, uh, uh, of the data you started with. Okay, so your residuals are always independent or orthogonal to your data coming in X. Okay, so those are. We won't use these relationships in today's class too much, but they are important to realize, especially I feel at the graduate level. We, we don't always focus on what this means in the undergraduate level, but it's really important to know what least squares is doing. 
because we see this in the Niepels algorithm, a series of linear regressions in the Niepels algorithm. If you go back and look at the Niepels algorithm, which is just a sequence of linear regressions, go and try this uh, uh, whenever you get back to your desk next time or we've got more energy than today. Go look at what this interpretation means. What is the residuals from the Niepels algorithm? What are those loops inside the Niepels algorithm? What are the residuals? What are x? What are y hat? What does it mean for one to be orthogonal to the other? Okay, because you'll actually learn quite a bit more about what PCA is doing. Uh, you get a rich interpretation if you look at that. And I may pick that up in the next class if I have some time. But yeah, you get some really powerful insights from that. Okay, let's move on to multiple linear regression. Because working with one X is no fun, we're going to work with multiple now. Multiple inputs to try and better predict the Y. So again, I'm assuming that our X data is centered. So we're going to calculate a regression coefficient for X1, a regression coefficient for X2, all the way up to capital K. So K variables in our regression model. We want to calculate one regression coefficient per column to predict our Y. So in a, picture, in a picture format, we've got our matrix X with N rows and K columns. That's shown up here, matrix X. We've got our vector Y, a single column with N rows. We're going to calculate what these K regression coefficients are to correspond one regression coefficient for every column in matrix X. Same thing as before to calculate the, the model. Minimize the sum of squares of those residuals in, in the vector E. So vector E is still a vector whether you're dealing with multiple linear regression or a single X variable. The residual vector is always just a single column. But now when we expand E, transpose E, we get a little bit more uh, messy matrix computation to work with. You can just take it for granted that solving that partial derivative, setting it to zero, gives you the well-known equation x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Again, x transpose x is the covariance matrix in the inverted. X transpose y, sorry, x transpose x is the, the correlation matrix, and x transpose y is the covariance matrix. So this is the this is sorry this is the covariance matrix. This is the covariance matrix of the columns of X with other columns in X, and X transpose Y is the covariance of X with Y. And the other key output from multiple linear regression is the standard error, which is E transpose E, same as the objective function over here. E transpose E is the sum of squares of the residuals. But what we do is we divide it through by the degrees of freedom, n minus k. Well, in most cases, n is much larger than k, in which instance you can interpret that as roughly being the standard deviation of the residuals. It would be one, it's an approximation. In the case where k is much smaller than n, that would be a valid way of interpreting the standard error. Now, what is the problem with this particular term over here? Anyone played around with matrix algebra and inverting matrices in MATLAB? Sorry, what's the problem? Yeah, with x, x transpose x inverse. What did I do there? I did it two years ago. You have to do something different with it, right? Yeah. So most, most good least squares packages will never actually implement and calculate your regression coefficients in this way. Okay? Because this is a very unstable procedure. And if x transpose x contains two columns which are correlated, that will actually fail. You cannot invert x transpose x when you've got two columns in x which are perfectly collinear. And if, even if they're not perfectly collinear, if they are approximately collinear, trying to calculate the inverse leads to unstable coefficients. So you get, if you make a small change in your data in x, like just in the last few decimal places in x, and you try to invert it, then you go try it on a different matrix x with another small change in x, you'll get totally different answers. 
which is no one wants that. No one wants to say, well, if my raw data changes in the, in the sixth decimal place, I'm going to get a different solution. That's not nice to see in any, in, in any uh, program. So X transpose X really cannot be inverted when you've got very correlated data. You should also be aware of interpreting the coefficients from a least squares model. For this very simple case where you've got two variables, x1 and x2, x1 and x2 over here on, on my uh, flat plane, and then vertically I'm drawing y. What the linear regression model is doing is it's just fitting a plane that best fits those data points. So my data points are shown here in red and white, open and closed circles. Some of these points are above and below the plane. That plane best fits those data. And the coefficient V1 is interpreted as looking at the data from this point onwards. So just looking at it from the forward face, from X1 perspective, V1 is by how much you will increase or decrease Y for a one unit change in X. And V2, looking at it from the perspective of the X2 axis, is the slope of the plane from that perspective and it's how much Y changes for a unit change in X. Okay, so we can interpret our, our linear regression models in that way. But the key thing is, X, V1 and V2 are not independent. They're actually calculated simultaneously from this equation over here. Okay, so the interpretation of V1 and V2 isn't always obvious. And I'll, I'll show a nice example of that in the next class. But it, it's something that you do need to be aware of. Okay, so before we get to the break, I'll just quickly look at, at some things that can go wrong with, P, uh, with, uh, with these squares. If you've got data going missing, your model cannot be used. So if, you, if you're trying to use your model in the future, the usual way is to say V1 times X1 plus V2 times X2 all the way up to VK times XK. But if any one of those variables goes missing, you, you can't calculate anything. V2, uh, sorry, if X2 goes missing, you don't have that value available, but you have X1, X3, and so on up to XK available, you still can't use the model. Okay? You're going to either underpredict or overpredict Y hat no matter what. There's absolutely no way you can use your least squares model if you have missing data. In fact, when you build your model up here, if any of the entries in this matrix go missing, you either have to delete that entire row or that entire column. Usually we try to delete the rows because we, we often have more rows than columns. But you can't build your model with missing data because you cannot calculate this quantity x transpose x and invert it if there's missing data present. Okay. So absolutely nothing we can do with missing data. The other problem is if you've got very highly correlated variables, okay, so in this instance, it's, it's really hard for me to describe it, but let's take x1 on this axis and x2 on that axis. And the red values you see here plotted, are these are the actual data points up here, but I'm projecting those data points down here just to illustrate the, the problem. In this particular case, x1 and x2 are clearly positively correlated. As x1 goes up, x2 goes up. And what, what will happen if one of these data points just shifts even slightly, that plane will, will rotate. So this plane is my plane given by my x transpose x in this x transpose y calculation. If I go and tweak the data here in x just slightly by adding a little bit of noise, the best fit plane, remember that's the objective function of these squares, is to try and find the sum of squares of residuals to be as small as possible. That plane can easily tumble around that, that axis. Just for small change in the data, just a, a, it can cause a big shift in the plane. So your V1 coefficient or your V2 coefficient, or both of them, can change quite, quite drastically for just small variations in the data. And, and don't just see it, well, I, I'm not going to ever change my data. Well, also see it from the perspective, what if you remove a row from your matrix? and you refit the model. You're going to get a totally different V1 and V2. Okay, and that's very unsatisfying 
from interpreting a model perspective, but also the confidence intervals for E1 and E2 are going to be huge. They're likely going to span zero. Okay? And so you'll get the interpretation, well, then none of my regression coefficients are significant. And drop them out of your model and refit it. Whereas that's actually misleading. Okay? Because it's, it's, it comes due to this very highly correlated X data over there. So here's a great example that you can do on your own. So I'd like you to do the following. It's not for homework or anything, but do the following. Go, go back to Excel or MATLAB or R, whichever is your, your weapon of choice, and create two variables, x1 and x2. So x1, just put any numbers you like there. 3, 4, minus 1, 2, 3, whatever. Okay? It doesn't, and, and use more than that. Then you say x2 is equal to 3 times x1 plus just some very small number, just some tiny offset, okay? Or you can even just say plus some random numbers and make that really small. The main point is that you want to create a new x variable that's extremely correlated to the first x variable with just a little bit of randomness added to it, okay? That's the key principle. Go calculate B is equal to X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. Calculate R squared, calculate your standard error. Then go back to this, this column for X2 and just change one of the entries in the row. So go say this one over here, this would have been 9.003, for example. Go change that to 9.01 and then refit the model and calculate your B value, your regression coefficients a second time. You can do that a couple of times. You'll see you'll get very different estimates for B every time. Your R squared will be roughly the same, your standard error will be roughly the same, but you'll get this very unsatisfying factor that B is changing so much and the confidence intervals will be as well to be really wide. Okay? In fact, if you make this random number too small, your software will, will likely crash. You won't calculate X transpose X. So give that a try on your own, and you can just prove that to yourself that that, that problem actually exists. So that picture is my best way that I can think of to try and illustrate. So is this clear? Yeah, she's like. Is this same? Are you just trying to say that if the column of x is really dependent, it's going to create a singular matrix? Exactly. Yeah. I just don't like to speak in mathematics. <laughs> yeah. But yes, it, the columns of x are linearly dependent. Cannot invert that X matrix in the same way. So you could end up having many solutions or none. That's exactly right. Yeah, you get multiple solutions. Okay. The reason why I want you to try and do this is because when in practice when we're measuring data from a process, we often have this case. Okay, so you might say to me, Kevin, this is just this is an artificial case. Sure, this is an artificial case here on the wall. But a real case would be a distillation column where your variables are the temperature, say, on the tray. So here's temperature on tray two, and here's temperature on tray three. If you plotted those two variables, they would be extremely correlated as well, okay, with a bit of random noise. So this is a real example of an artificial example. So that's the second factor that could go wrong. The third is the PCA model assumption is that you've measured your x without error. So that you would have heard that before when you covered least squares in any, any undergraduate course. The assumption is your x's are measured without error. That's true. The assumption that least squares makes is that your y has error. Least squares assumes that x is perfectly measured. It, it accepts error in the y. Okay, so that residual over here is associated with y. That residual is not associated with x. What we say is that least squares has a model for error in the y. So least squares accepts error in the y. It builds a model for error in the y squared. Because after I fit that model, after I fit that b1 value, I get a vector of residuals e. Okay? Once I have that vector of residuals e, I can go plot them as a histogram, say. And that histogram should be centered at zero. 
and I can go look at the spread of that histogram. And that spread is roughly equal to the stacked error. It's roughly equal to the spread of the residuals. So that's great. This standard error then, or this histogram, either one of those two, you can, you can interpret that this is a model for my errors. In the future, if I get a new observation, x nu, and I multiply it by b1, I'm going to get y hat nu. And then, once I have y hat nu, I can say y hat nu minus y. Let's presume that in the future, I have my x nu, and maybe after a couple of hours or days, after I've calculated my y hat nu, I get what my real y nu was. Okay, maybe this was a lab measurement that took a couple of hours or days to come, but I do get it eventually, and I can calculate e nu. Once I have e nu, I can see Let's say E nu was somewhere over here. Okay, so this is where E nu lies. Because I'm, I'm overlaying E nu on the histogram of my residuals when I build my model. And I can now tell, yes, that residual lies within the space of my previous residuals. That prediction was good. Or if E nu lies all the way out here, I can say, well, hang on, there was something <laughs> totally wrong with your model. Your model predicted a certain value, but the residual distance here, that distance, is way bigger than any of the residuals that I had when I built my model. Okay, so this is helpful to diagnose problems, is having a model for the residuals. And in this case, the crudest way that you can summarize this model is with a single number, the standard error. A better way of summarizing the model's residuals is by showing a histogram. That gives you a bit more context, but that's a bit that's hard to convey to someone. So some, we summarize that by just often calculating the standard error, which is really roughly equal to one standard deviation of the residuals, assuming it's a normal distribution. So this is really helpful because we can go use it in the future to judge whether our model is working well or not. Okay, but the key point is these squares does not have a model for the x space. We have no way of telling that the data we put in here in x is, is any good. Okay. What would be nice, and this, this is a, there is a model for this uh, sort of thing, is to say y is equal to v1 x plus error for x plus error for y. So if you build this model, and you're now calculating the residuals for x as well as residuals for y. Okay, and this sort of model is called error in variables regression. We won't cover it, of course. But that, this is what I mean. P, uh, least squares does not have a model for errors in x. It assumes that our x is measured perfectly. Okay, so that leads to situations like um, where you can put in garbage, total garbage input as your x variable in x nu. I can put any any value and then multiply it by v1, I'm going to get a regression prediction, y nu. I can calculate my residuals and I can see what that residual value is. Okay? <coughs> but the problem is we can never detect whether the input x is of, is of, any, is of any good quality or not. Okay? There's no x space model for the errors to catch whether our input is garbage. So people often do the following, which is really bad. So never do this. But you see this all the time. I see this <laughs> too many times. Let's say you built this regression model. Here's x1, here's x2, and these values here represent the range of the data when you built the model originally. And the blue plane represents the, the linear regression model. So people say, as long as my x value, my x1, for my new observation, given by the star over here, the open star, as long as that x1 value is within the range when I built my model, and as long as the x2 for that new observation is within the range when I built my model, I can use my least squares model. My least squares model is good as long as my input data is within the range of the variables when I built the model. Okay? You can see from this illustration why that's just garbage, because this new data point over here, yes, it is within the range of x1 and it is within the 
range of x2, but it doesn't obey the relationship of the data when you built your model. It's totally different over here. So it's like that example with the monitoring that we looked at last class. This observation lies far out of, out of this, this space. This is really the true space where the, where the data does move. This new observation lies well outside that space. Sure, I can go ahead and make a prediction and, and give you a y hat, but that y hat doesn't mean anything. Okay, it's it's a to it could be right, it could be wrong, but I've got no way of telling. I've got no way of telling that this x1 and x2 value for the star point over here is any good either. I cannot use the rule that as long as I'm within the range of x1 and x2 of my training data, that I'm okay. That is not the valid way ever of testing your inputs. Never test your input data using that approach. And then some final problems with linear regression is multiple linear regression requires we have more observations than columns. That's simply because we need to estimate k regression coefficients and we need more data points than that uh, to solve that x transpose x into this x transpose y. And that's a big problem when we're dealing with spectral data. Right? So I had an illustration of the spectral data. There's many, many columns in X, but often we only have a few samples to calibrate that with. So if N is much smaller than K, we cannot use multiple linear regression. So when people go and do that is they say, well, I don't need so many columns. I'm just going to pick a few of them to get N greater than K. Um, but that's so awesome. And also, MLR requires that you've got more. Sorry, MLR can only build one model per column in Y whereas we sometimes have multiple columns of y. So you have to go build a new model for every single y variable that you have. Okay, so let's take a break here for...